Well, we are talking about encouragement this morning. Now, if you were to look up encouragement in the dictionary, you would see a definition, something along the lines of to inspire with courage. I mean, courage is right there in the word encouragement, right? And a lot of times we don't think of it in those terms. But it can be a listening ear, a shoulder to cry on, a, a, a well-placed word, uh, just something where you take the time and inspire someone to courage, inspire someone to just take the next step, to, to keep walking, even when we don't feel like it. It reminded me of a, a story that I read several years ago about a new baby, Peterson family, so this may resonate with you, but it was, it was before the baby came. This young lady was in her somewhere around her eighth or ninth month of pregnancy, and I'm not going to pretend to know what that feels like. Other than that from the outside looking in, it looks pretty miserable, especially in the heat of summer. And this was a young lady who was just honestly done with being pregnant. And so she came into her mom's house sore, swollen, everything was hurting. She plopped down on the couch and said, Mom, I am done with being pregnant. Well, the mother did something I thought was pretty wise. Instead of counseling her or trying to talk her into things, she walked over to the bookcase, she pulled out a book, and went and sat beside her daughter and opened up, of all things, a photo album. And together they started flipping through baby pictures. And suddenly this young, soon-to-be mom, who was so discouraged and in so much discomfort was transported away from her present discomfort to think about the joy that was to come. That's encouragement. That's helping someone in their moment of discouragement, of discomfort, of being done to inspire them with courage to take the next step. It reminded me of a hospital visit I made several years ago. Now, at a previous church, I used to work with college, and, uh, college students and young adults, and there was a young lady that was in the hospital for some health issues, and I came and was just sitting with her, and, and she looked at me and she said, Mark, would you read Romans chapter eight? And as she's laying there in, in this long illness that she was dealing with, she was in a lot of pain, she just kind of laid her head back and closed her eyes, and I started reading Romans chapter 8. And if you've ever read that, it has tremendous words, such as, I do not consider that the, the present suffering is even worth being compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. It's in Romans 8 that we read that God works all things together for our good to those who know him and are called according to his purpose. It's Romans chapter 8 that says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? And if he who did not spare his own son, but instead freely gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And by hearing these powerful words of scripture, she was encouraged this idea of being inspired to, to keep going, to take the next step. Now, I hope that everyone in this room has experienced what it means to be encouraged. That if you've had a time when you were down or discouraged or just wanted to give up, that someone came along beside you and either gave a listening ear, a shoulder to cry on, maybe they shared scripture, maybe they prayed for you, Maybe they were, they were just there. But it gave you the courage to keep going. I hope you've experienced that. Well, the Bible says a lot about encouraging each other. 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verse 11 says, encourage one another and build each other up. In Hebrews 10, it says, don't forsake gathering together as the church, but encourage each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. But not only does the Bible give us verses and commands that we should be encouraging, but the Bible gives us an example. It gives us a person, a, a character in the Bible who's, who's known for being an encourager. You may think you know his name, but you might not. Does anyone know his name? See, you're saying Barnabas. That was a trick question. 
His name is Joseph. But everyone called him Barnabas. That was his nickname. Barnabas means son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. Now, in the Greek language that the New Testament was written in, the, the word for encouragement has to do with coming along beside. It's, it, it's a form of a word that Jesus used when he was talking to his disciples and said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. But he called the Holy Spirit a helper or a comforter. And the same word that she said, the Holy Spirit was one that's going to come along beside you and strengthen, empower, equip, give you the strength to take that next step. This is the, the form of that word that's being used here. Barnabas is the son of encouragement. Now, here's the part that just encouraged me so much. The, the story of Barnabas is told in the book of Acts. Now, Acts is a book that we spent our entire summer going through the first seven chapters. Now, by the way, we're going to pick up again in Acts starting next week. So if you're new with us, if you're a guest with us, we're starting a new series uh, next Sunday on Acts chapter, starting with Acts chapter 8. And we'd love to have you, we're not doing pizza every Sunday, but we'd love to have you come back and join us uh, for this study that we'll be going through. But Acts is basically the story of how the church started and how the church spread throughout the known world. It's a story, as you would expect, of really dramatic things. It's a fascinating book to study. And we see in this book dramatic works of God. I mean, he sends the Holy Spirit. Everyone gathered in Jerusalem for a, a, a big party, a festival that they called Pentecost. And while they were gathered there, the Holy Spirit came and there was sounds like a mighty rushing wind. There were flames like fire. Dramatic things happening. In the book of Acts, you see people healed. You see demons cast out. You see all this stuff, dramatic works of God. You also see powerful proclamations of the gospel. You see people getting up and, and, and preaching the gospel in such a way that people were convinced. You also see courage. I mean, all of this is happening in the face of persecution, and people are standing strong, and you see incredible boldness in the midst of persecution. And I look at this dramatic works of God, powerful preaching, boldness in the face of persecution, and honestly, that's what I would expect to see in a book that talks about how the church was born and then spread throughout the world. I would expect to see the dramatic stuff happening. What I don't expect to see is that in the midst of this narrative of God doing huge, amazing things, we also read the story of Joseph, Barnabas, the encourager. Not one who's going out and you see dramatic works or bold preaching or incredible boldness in the face of persecution, but you see him quietly going around encouraging those around him. And as we see in the book of Acts, this is a significant role in the beginning and the spread of the church. And it leads me to this conclusion that we should never underestimate the importance or the power of encouragement. That part of what God used to spread the gospel through the whole world is someone who is simply known as an encourager. I hope we learn from his example today that each of us can take this responsibility, this important ministry of encouraging those around us. So this morning, we're going to take a look at his story. We're going to see how, as we follow his story, that encouragers are usually generous people. We're going to see that encouragers come alongside of other people at times when they need it. And at the end, I hope this is something that, that we are able to, to put into practice in our own lives. So I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. This is where we're introduced to Joseph, also known as Barnabas. Acts chapter 4. If you have a, like a physical Bible like this, it's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. If you have the Venture app, just open the sermon notes because all the sermon is, all, all the scripture is in there for you. Uh, for those electric, by the way, I, I love being one of those churches that instead of saying turn off your cell phones, we say please pull them out uh, and, and follow along on there. But once again, if you check your fantasy football scores during church, you will lose this weekend. That's just how it works. So 
Use these devices for the right reasons. Acts chapter four, I'm speaking from experience, by the way. Guilty as charged. <laughs> so here's where we meet Barnabas. And as we enter this passage, we're gonna see that Barnabas was a generous person. And I don't think it's accidental that when we're introduced to him as a son of encouragement, we see him doing, uh, practicing generosity. Because I, we're gonna look at this in a minute, but I think part of being an encourager is, is being generous. So let's look at this. Acts chapter four, we're gonna start reading at verse 36. Thus Joseph, who is also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So immediately we see his name's Joseph, but everyone knew him as an encourager, and the first thing we see him doing is practicing generosity. I mean, he, he did something sacrificial. He sold a piece of his property, and he brought the money and gave it to the apostles, gave it to the church so that they could use it to meet the needs of people in the church. Now, if you were to read the larger context, you would know this was common practice in the early church. One of the first things we read about the church is that no one was in need. If someone was, in, was hungry, people would either bring him food or they would go sell something and give them the money so they could have food. No one was in need. They, they said, if I have a house, you're welcome to stay in it. If I have some, some chickens, you're, you're welcome to eat the eggs. I mean, it was just, we are sharing things because we are the body of Christ. And so it was not unusual for people to, to give of their possessions, to even sell things to help others. But this is an extreme step, to go and sell your property and bring the money and say, apostles, I'm gonna give it to you because you know who have the needs in this church. So I'm gonna give it to trust in, in trusting you. And it brings up this, this idea, son of encouragement showing generosity. I think for us, in order to encourage people, we need to be generous. And, and here's what I mean. Sometimes, if you're wanting to just sit and listen to someone, or to share with someone, or check in on, doesn't it often happen with, let me buy you a cup of coffee? Or, for those of you in, in you know, where I often am of not having a whole lot of extra money, Cokes are a dollar at McDonald's right now. You know, it's like, hey, let, let, let me invest a dollar in, into you, and, and, and to just hear what you're going through. And, and, and just kind of share life together. And maybe I can share some scripture with you that will be encouraging. Or maybe you just need somebody to listen. But let's go take, it costs a little something. Maybe it's let me take you out to lunch. And just listen and be with you. Sometimes we see more extravagant gifts. I remember as a college student, a group of us went out to eat, and this was one of those times I, I was really low on cash, so I'm at the table lining up my quarters to see how much I can order, only to find out when the bill came, the, our server said, your bill has been taken care of. Someone else in the restaurant has treated your entire table to lunch. And I remember walking away from that thinking, that was amazing. I mean, I was so encouraged by that because I saw God's hand of provision in this act of generosity. Maybe you've experienced the unexpected check in the mail or the refund that you weren't planning on. Maybe a, a, a small inheritance from someone you didn't even know you were related to. I mean, so some of these things just happen. And it's so encouraging when you are the recipient of this act of generosity, which should compel us to turn around and be generous with others. Now, by the way, this is just talking about money. We are also generous with our resources, with our homes, with our vehicles. When we begin to understand, that, you know, this really all belongs to God, so I'm gonna use it to show his love to people and be generous with it. Or the one commodity that we all have is time. You see, there are people in this room for, for on a whole spectrum of how much money we have. But everyone in this room has the same amount of time. Each one of us woke up this morning with 24 hours in this day. And a lot of times, what it means to be an encourager is to be generous, not just with our money and our resources, but our time. It takes time to listen to people. But this is what we see in Barnabas. We see that he was a generous person. We see his generosity and that he's donating this field and, and giving it to the church. But as we keep telling his story, we're gonna see how generous he was also with his time. 
Now, as we move into the next few passages, we're going to see, remember, encouragement has the idea of coming along beside. And we're going to see three times in the book of Acts where Barnabas comes alongside of people who are in need. So we're going to see, first of all, that he was a generous person. That's important to being an encourager. We're also going to see coming alongside people at, at a time when they need a special touch from someone. Uh, we're going to see this played out in Barnabas' life. So we're going to look at these three different snapshots of, of Barnabas coming alongside people. The first person he came alongside was, was the Apostle Paul, but he wasn't known yet as an apostle, and he wasn't known yet as Paul. He was known as Saul. Now, if you, we meet Saul earlier in the book of Acts when Stephen was being killed by being stoned. And Saul was a young man, and as they drove, Stephen, by the way, was, was one of the, the, the leaders. He wasn't an apostle, but he was one of the leaders that took care of, of distributing food to those people who were in need. He was also a very bold preacher, and he was brought in on trial. He declared the gospel, and they were so angry, they covered their ears, they gnashed their teeth, they ran him outside the city, they picked up rocks, and they stoned him. Saul was there. You see, the people that stoned him took off their, their outer garments, their coats, and they laid them at the feet of this young man named Saul, who was in full-hearted approval of killing this man of God. And we see two things that happen after this stoning. One is that we see Christians scatter because they were looking for safer places to live and safer places to, to plant churches. The other thing we see out of this is that Saul started terrorizing the church. He's going into homes and dragging people out and having them thrown in prison. And we see him just being feared by people in the church. And, and, and he was so passionate. At one point, he, he got permission to go to the city of Damascus to, to arrest Christians. And as he's on the road to Damascus, he has an encounter with the risen Lord Jesus. And his life is completely changed. He goes from being a persecutor of the church to a passionate Christ follower. Well, three years pass, and he makes his way to Jerusalem. So here's this young believer, Saul, soon to be Paul. I'll probably call him both. Through, so it's the same guy. He comes back to Jerusalem, basically saying, hey, guys, I'm a Christ follower now, but who's he coming back to? <laughs> He's coming back to the people he used to terrorize. I mean, he may have dragged your mother off to jail, or your cousin. You may have had this great Bible study until Saul came in and started dragging people off to prison. And now he shows up again saying, hey, you trust me now because I'm a Christian. Do you know what their response was? <laughs> they didn't trust him. He came to the disciples, those who followed Jesus, and they wanted nothing to do with him. Enter the son of encouragement. Enter Barnabas, who comes alongside of this new believer, this new Christ follower, and he listens, and he believes, and he trusts him, and he builds a bridge between him and the apostles. Look at Acts chapter 9. Let's see how Barnabas was so instrumental uh, in the life of, of Saul. Verse 26, and when he, speaking of Saul, when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him. Barnabas came along beside him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke with him and how in Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he, Saul, went in and out among them at Jerusalem preaching boldly the name of the Lord. Here's the point. Saul became the apostle Paul, the most influential apostle in the history of the church. But before Saul became the Apostle Paul, he needed a Barnabas. He needed a Barnabas to come alongside, to listen, to trust, to represent, to give him the courage to take the next step. Well, we, we see Barnabas show up again a few chapters later. What has happened is that as, as persecution scattered the church. They ended up in all these different cities, and a group of them ended up in Syria in a city called Antioch. Antioch was this thriving city, and the church started thriving. They, they put together a little church. All kinds of people started turning to Christ. And I do mean all kinds of people because they weren't all Jewish. 
And the church back in Jerusalem wasn't sure what to do about that. This was a big topic of conversation in the church. Well, what do we do about these people coming to Christ that aren't Jewish? Well, what they decided here in Jerusalem is let's, let's send some representatives to go up and investigate, kind of check out what's going on. This was fairly common as new works of God popped up around the world. And I would guess if I was there in Antioch, excited about what the Lord was doing, I might be just a little bit nervous of the guy coming from, from headquarters and to, to investigate and to make sure we're doing things right because they're seeing the grace of God. They're seeing people coming to Christ. They're excited about the work, but I can't help but imagine they might have been a little uptight about someone coming from Jerusalem. And if they were at all uptight, they would have been so excited when they saw that the person who came from Jerusalem was not one of the 12 apostles. Can you guess who it was? <laughs> it was Barnabas. They sent the encourager to see what was going on at Antioch. And let's read about that. We see this played out in Acts chapter 9. So if you turn a couple pages to the right, Acts chapter 9, we're going to start at verse 21. Look what's going on in this church. Acts 11, verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, the church in Antioch. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. He exhorted them. He exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to, Saul, to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Okay, now there's, this is pretty crazy. If they were at all nervous, suddenly here comes Barnabas, the encourager, the son of encouragement, the one who comes alongside people. And what is his response? He is glad. He sees the grace of God and he celebrates with them. He exhorts them, which by the way is another word for encouragement. He encourages them don't be distracted. Keep doing what you're doing. Stay on mission. Keep moving forward. Have the courage to take the next step. He's bringing encouragement to this young church in Antioch. And then it tells us, it kind of describes Barnabas. It says three things. First of all, it says he was a good man. Now that seems like such a common thing to say. He's a good guy. Did you know though, out of all of the heroes that God uses in the book of Acts, this is the only time you see someone described as a good man. He's a good man. He's full of the Holy Spirit. And understand this, what's happening in the book of Acts is that the risen Lord Jesus is building his church through people that are empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we often read these people are full of the Holy Spirit, but then we see that he's full of faith. Now, I want to come back to this at the end of the message, but I just notice this, that Barnabas, who is an encourager, is full of faith. He encourages the church, and I love what he does next. He says, guys, this is going great. Give me a few days. I'm going to go find Saul. Don't miss the irony here. Do you know why these believers were living in Antioch? Because the persecution drove them out of Jerusalem. Who was persecuting them in Jerusalem? It was Saul. So what does Barnabas do? He said, you know, I've got the perfect guy that's going to help you learn the, the, the depths of Scripture and learn the, the truth about who God is. And he goes and he brings the guy that drove them out of Jerusalem to Antioch and says, this guy's awesome. You're going to love listening to this guy. I mean, they had to be thinking, what is going on here? But this is what an encourager does. He comes alongside Saul. He comes alongside this young church. And we see that they stayed there for an entire year. Remember, encouraging takes time. They say they're for an entire year teaching and preaching this young church. We read that this is where the disciples were first called Christians, little Christ. But we also see within a couple of chapters, this, this church in Antioch, this is the first church to send out missionaries. 
the missionary movement through the book of Acts does not come from the church in Jerusalem. It comes from the church in Antioch. They send out Barnabas and Paul on the first missionary journey. Understand this. They became the leading church for world missions. But before they came, they became the leading church for world missions. They needed a Barnabas. Before Saul became the Apostle Paul, he needed a Barnabas. Before the church in Antioch became the mission-sending church, they needed a Barnabas. Never underestimate the importance and the power of encouragement. It's not only potentially life-changing, it's potentially world-changing. Well, w one more snapshot we see is Paul and Barnabas went on this missionary journey, and for a part of it, they were joined by... Barnabas, we find out later, it's his cousin. His kid cousin, John Mark, comes and joins them. But he didn't stay very long. He got discouraged, and he quit. Well, you get to Acts chapter 15, and Paul has this great idea. Let's go back and visit all of these churches and see how they're doing. Barnabas says, a great idea, but let's bring John Mark. Paul says, what, you mean the quitter? The guy who gave up? I'm not bringing him. You can tell where this story is going, but I want to read it to you in Acts chapter 15. So turn just a couple more pages to your right. Let's look at Acts chapter 15. And let's start down at verse 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with him John called Mark. But Paul thought it best not to, take him, not to take with him one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. I don't want the quitter around here with me. And there arose such a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. We can stop there. We see that Paul takes someone else, Silas, and they go on their missionary journey. You've got a quitter who needs a second chance, and you've got a guy who's known as the, the son of encouragement. You just see what's going to happen, don't you? The Barnabas, the one who comes alongside others, inspires them to courage to take the next step. Of course he's going to chase after the quitter who needs a second chance. At this point, the rest of the, the book focuses on Paul and his ministry. We don't really see Barnabas much more in the Bible. He pops up a few times, but not very often. We don't read a whole lot of John Mark until the book of 2 Timothy. Paul is just about to be executed. And he's in this prison cell awaiting his execution, writing a letter to Timothy. And here's what he says. He says, only Luke is here with me. Bring Mark when you come to visit me because he is useful to me in ministry. So how did John Mark go from being the quitter to someone who was useful to Paul in ministry? I think you have to look at the power of encouragement, that Barnabas, the son of encouragement, spent time with the one who needed a second chance. Do you see the power and the importance of encouragement before Saul became the Apostle Paul, he needed a Barnabas. Before this young church at Antioch became the one that sent missionaries all over the world, they needed a Barnabas. Before John Mark became someone who is useful in ministry, he needed a Barnabas. As you read the story of the spread of the church in the book of Acts, one of the storylines you read is the story of encouragement and how God used Barnabas to change the lives of people and through that, the world was changed. Oh, we need encouragers today, don't we? We are a divided culture, a hurting culture. We're a lonely culture. It's been many years since Paul McCartney was going around and he noticed all of these older ladies off on their own by themselves and he was just thinking about how lonely they must be and he wrote a song about it. Do you remember that? Eleanor Rigby picks up the rice in the church where the wedding has been. She just stares out the window. Look at all the lonely people. Where do they all come from? Look at all the lonely people. Where do they all belong? 
our answer should be you belong in the body of Christ. Billy Joel, a few years later, talked about sitting in a bar, and he describes all these people that are sitting in the bar. And do you remember what he said? They're sharing a drink they call what? Loneliness. But it's better than drinking alone. I mean, I, I mean we've seen it all through pop culture. We are a lonely, hurting people, desperate for sons and daughters of encouragement to come alongside and inspire each other to take the next step. This is something everyone in this room can do, and let me wrap up by giving you three quick suggestions for how I think we can do it that come right out of this passage. First of all is to practice generosity. If we take the time to buy a cup of coffee, buy someone lunch, buy someone a drink at McDonald's, and just listen. You don't have to say something profound. Oftentimes, it's better not to say anything, but just to be there. But to practice generosity. Secondly, and I told you I'd come back to this one, is to have faith. You see, I believe encouragement is deeply rooted in the cross of Christ. It's deeply rooted in the gospel. Because here's the message of the gospel. That all of our pain, all of our sin, all of our shame, all of this was placed on Jesus on the cross. See, the gospel message is simply this, that each of us are guilty because we have sinned and we are separated eternally from God. And the only hope we have is that Jesus came and died on the cross, taking the, the punishment that we deserved. And it wasn't just to be an example of here's what it looks like to suffer. It was as our substitute in our place. And when we trust Jesus, we are forgiven of our sins that separate us from God. We are adopted into his family so that we are sons and daughters of God. We are promised eternal life with God forever. This, and by the way, when you're placed in Christ, all the promises that we read in Scripture find their yes and their amen in Jesus Christ. It means that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It means that we are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. It means that Christ in you is your hope and glory. It does mean that God works all things together for our good and for his glory. It does mean that if God did not give up his own son, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? These are the promises that are ours in Christ. And do you see how when we have faith that God will do what he promised that he would do, we have all we need to encourage those around us. All we have to do is remind people, look what God has said he would do. I know life stinks. I know it's hard. I know you don't feel like taking the next step, but let's look for a minute at the gospel and the rich promises that are ours in Christ that God has stamped and sealed. Yes and amen through Jesus. And, and let's be encouraged by that. If we have faith in the promises of God, so we need to be generous. We also need to be people of faith. And then the final thing I'll say is <laughs> we need to just do it. People are not encouraged by your good intentions. And how many times have we had that prompting? I should go give that person a hug. I should, I should see if I can buy lunch for that guy. I should reach out and just say, yeah, seems like you're down. I just want you to know I'm praying for you. How many times do we feel those nudges and we just don't even act upon them? I think so many of us, we, we know how to encourage, we just, maybe we lack the courage to, to take that step and do it. Maybe we're so afraid we're gonna say something wrong or we're gonna make matters worse by saying something we shouldn't. Listen, people actually show quite a bit of grace at those times. And don't put this pressure on yourself that you have to fix everything. You don't, you just have to be present with people. So just do it. Isn't it amazing, the story of God changing the world through the church? Dramatic works of God, powerful sermons, boldness, but also a son of encouragement who came alongside Saul, who became the influential Apostle Paul, came alongside a young church plant, that became the first church to send missionaries to the entire world, came alongside a quitter who needed a second chance, who became useful for ministry. 
This is the ministry God is calling us to. Now may we be the ones who practice generosity, who have faith that God is true to his promises, and that we just do it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time that we've had. I pray that you will uh, use this word, not that we will just walk out uh, having heard some thoughtful things, but that we would leave here more committed to being an encouragement to people around us. Father, we look in our church, we look in our culture, we look all over the place. There's such a need for you to raise up sons and daughters of encouragement. I pray that we would, as people, never underestimate the power and the importance of a word of encouragement. Thank you for this time we've had, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.